So yeah, thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak a little bit about uh, our company. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO. Uh, my name is Vince Candia, and then uh, Mudit uh, Saxena on our data science team is going to uh, jump in and, and speak about a few things as well. Um, just briefly talking a little bit about my path because I think it's a, a little bit unique, but I have about 10 years of experience in the sports entertainment industry. Uh, so I uh, started my uh, career uh, after business school in Los Angeles with a company called AEG. Uh, they're the largest facilities owner operator uh, in the world for arenas. So they have 110 arenas uh, that they own or operate and have sports and concerts and all that sort of stuff going on there. Uh, and uh, really, really cut my teeth uh, in the industry, uh, starting out with the LA Kings and, and their business intelligence team. That's really where I started my career. Uh, built out the, the BI group there. Uh, we were doing a lot of great things. Uh, and then uh, in 2013, AG put itself up for a sale, and my boss took the job as uh, president and CEO of the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, so I moved to Portland. Uh, that's the, the bottom half of this image here. But uh, yeah, it was, in, it was in Portland. I was SVP of business operations for uh, the Portland Trailblazers for just over four years. Uh, oversaw ticket operations, business intelligence, uh, revenue strategy, and, and technology uh, for the group there. So in terms of uh, popularity of analytics and sports, really it became popular with Moneyball. Uh, it, I don't know if you guys have read the book or, or seen the movie, but uh, analytics and sports have, have really gotten popular, I'd say, over the course of the last 15 years have, have grown uh, very quickly in terms of popularity. So using player data uh, in order to uh, help evaluate trade moves, uh, free agent signings, and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I think the my focus primarily, about 95% of my career has been on the, I think it's fun, but more boring business side of things, I think, and fan data side of things. And, and that's primarily what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but uh, the, the reason I, I like to show this uh, is because I think for the industry as a whole, uh, it actually was a really positive uh, trend. And a lot of smart owners and smart people started to see the benefit of using analytics and player data. Uh, and they also realized that it wasn't just about putting the best players on the field in terms of driving revenues and getting fans to be uh, happy with their experience. Uh, so they started to invest in the business side and the fan experience uh, and analytics around understanding their customers. Uh, and that's really where uh, about the same time that uh, my, my career started. Uh, you know, so, something unique about the, the industry uh, that I like to point out is, I, I could, because I think it is somewhat unique, is you have a really engaged fan base. So you're, you're marrying this uh, really excited, passionate group of people uh, with a whole bunch of touch points. And as a sports and entertainment franchise, and I say entertainment because, uh, you know, concerts and for us, we're, we're really in the live audience, not just sports space, although most of our clients are, are in the, our sports franchises. Uh, what we found is is that people are really passionate, and so you know if you go to a supermarket and they send you a customer survey, you know if you get one percent response rate on those, that's pretty good. Whereas in our industry, we'll see twenty five percent, thirty percent response rates on a customer survey. Uh, very passionate people. Uh, it provides a very passionate uh, and engaged data set for us. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, rare to see email open rates in the 60 plus percent range for season ticket holders or 40 percent plus for uh, just general fans. And so, uh, so that's good news for our data science team because they like to, to leverage that data. Uh, so we've been up and running for about uh, two years now. Uh, you know, we're, we're a software as a service uh, customer data platform we, we've created. Uh, so we're really using uh, data science uh, and machine learning in order to uh, do, a, do a few different things uh, for some big sports entertainment brands. We've been growing very quickly, uh, and uh, I think uh, it's very uh, exciting for, for us to be doing this in Calgary. I'm, I'm from Calgary originally, so i um, very passionate about the city. Uh, and, and three big areas that we're really focused on and, and, um, and, and getting results in. Uh, number one is lack of ticket price optimization. This is still an area uh, where we see a ton of upside potential. Uh, still a lot of uh, very manual decision making going around uh, optimizing price points uh, in uh, venues uh, for, uh, for a myriad of events. Uh, ticket holder and member churn is a big one uh, for the industry, uh, something uh, that the industry is grappling with as a whole. Uh, I, you know, the, flame, the hometown flames would be a bit of an outlier. Uh, they have had you know, really great attendance, as have a lot of the, the Canadian hockey teams. 
Uh, but overall, as an industry, there's about 15 to 20 percent churn on average uh, from franchise to franchise. So uh, that's really the lifeblood of these uh, sports franchises. And if uh, if they're not able to renew their season ticket holders year in and year out, uh, that's something that uh, is super impactful to their their top and bottom lines. Uh, so uh, so that's an area that we're focused on, trying to predict which of those season ticket holders might churn uh, before uh, before they do. Uh, so that's that's part of it. And then identifying and capturing new customers, uh, something that still amazes me, even though I've been in, in the industry for a long time, is for individual event uh, or game buyers, we see about uh, 85 to 90 percent of those churn year in and year out. So somebody might go to uh, a Flames game uh, last year, uh, and they're, they're very unlikely to come back and purchase again uh, this season. Uh, some of that is is still... Uh, going to improve with uh, you know de-anonymizing ticket purchasers because you still don't know everybody that's in your building. Uh, but uh, there is a big opportunity, and we've been able to really increase conversion using analytics uh, around uh, some of those new purchasers. Uh, in terms of uh, you know for us, uh, we we do tie into these different uh, technologies. So people always ask me when I when I start talking about this, they're like, "Oh, isn't Ticketmaster already doing this?" I say, well, they tried to about five years ago. They're not doing it very well, uh, and so uh, they've really taken more of an open, uh, an open approach where they're now partnering with organizations. So with the leading ticketing companies, we integrate with all of them. Uh, if you guys are tennis fans and you buy a U.S. Open tennis tournament ticket for the summer, uh, that shows up uh, in our in our cloud environment, uh, and then our uh, our UI and our predictive uh, algorithms are, are sitting on top of those ticket sales transactions. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, really how we work, um, so the organizations are capturing that personally identifiable information on customers uh, through, uh, you know, through first-party data sources. Uh, in the U.S., uh, third-party data sources uh, are, uh, are also, uh, you know, the data is much more rich, so we do, uh, we will leverage demographic and, and psychographic information uh, down in the U.S. Uh, in Canada, not, not so much uh, because everything's at the, the postal code level. Uh, but, uh, but that data gets transferred across to us automatically uh, by API or sometimes just S SFTP file transfer depending on the data source. Uh, it shows up in our cloud and we, we have a, built a, a robust star schema to really map all this data uh, and make sure that we can uh, drive our product off of it in a performant way. Uh, it's something we're really focused on is, is that performance. Uh, we score uh, and come up with pricing recommendations. Mudit will talk about that a little bit. Uh, but we come up with that, that scoring and pass that back to the franchises. Uh, and either that's through our UI, uh, sometimes we pass it back into their own uh, data infrastructures as well. Uh, and then as customers take action on that data or don't, so if we say, hey, you know, here's somebody that we think is uh, likely to churn as a season ticket member, we think you should run some sort of a promotion against that, uh, that person to try and you know, breed their affinity uh, and uh, breed their engagement. Uh, if they don't react to that or if they do react to that, that data point shows up back in our model again uh, and our model continues to tune, get smarter. Uh, our data science team is constantly uh, tweaking and trying different approaches as well. So uh, I think you know, Mudit would be very realistic that it's, it's a journey we're on and, and continuing to improve upon. Uh, you know, we're getting some good results, but, uh, but definitely uh, we're, we're always trying to get better. Um, yeah, the one, one point, and I, I won't go on for too much longer here, uh, but uh, one point I like to make, we, we have this program called Stellar Moments where uh, it's basically a notification system where we're identifying opportunities uh, that we find in the underlying data. Uh, you know, some of that is you know, simple queries that, uh, that we're able to highlight opportunities for, for our customers uh, without them having to do a whole bunch of analysis. Uh, and some of them are, are more robust using, using data science. But, uh, you know, the idea, uh, the way the industry has evolved, and this is similar for, I think, a lot of uh, customer-facing uh, customer businesses, is, you know, you have a question that you're trying to get answered. You walk down the hallway to an analyst and try and ask them to, you know, pick, pick out a customer segment for you. Uh, they go, they do some analysis, it takes time, uh, and then they come back to you with the answer. You run some sort of campaign, you wait again, and then you go back down the hallway and you ask them, hey, how did that cam how's that campaign doing? 
uh, with these stellar moments, what we're doing is we're, you know, we're queuing up opportunities uh, right when they happen and say, hey, here's, here's some buyers that purchased multiple events last year and they've come back this year and they've purchased multiple events again. Uh, they also match the demographic profiles and, and psychographic profiles of uh, an engagement behavior of somebody that uh, is one of your top customers. Uh, so would you like to export and push them into a campaign? Uh, and then we get to see the results of those campaigns. So that's, that's our stellar uh, moments program that we're getting uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of great results with. In terms of uh, our ecosystem and our tech stack, I like to show this one because people usually ask me, but uh, we're, we're using a, a Node.js uh, front end. Uh, we rely pretty heavily on, on high charts, uh, for, uh, which is an open, uh, an open source uh, JavaScript library for, for all of our data visualization. Uh, we do use WebGL. Uh, we've developed a, a lot of our venue maps, uh, which I'll, I'll show you guys a couple screenshots, but uh, we're getting some really good um, results with using WebGL. Uh, you know, for our analytics layer, uh, Mudit will, can talk about this a bit more, but primarily in R um, is kind of the, the main piece for us. We're hosted in Amazon's cloud using SQL Server and MongoDB. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, just moving in, into MongoDB, but from a performance standpoint, we're, we're really liking what it, what it can do for us. Uh, so, and then, you know, our integration partners, we have, we have a whole bunch of them. I've just listed a few here. So other than that, I, I just, I've thrown in some, some UI screenshots uh, here that, that I'll move through and let Mudit um, you know, talk through the data science side, but able to really see a, a ton of metrics in our UI. Everything is, is very actionable, so that's something that we really uh, work to differentiate around. Uh, you know, we found with, find with a lot of the off-the-shelf tools uh, that the data is not as actionable as our clients want, uh, and so we, we really make it actionable. We tie in with, uh, with their source systems, allow them to push data uh, really easily back and forth uh, between the source systems. Uh, but uh, I think you know we do have you know long-term knowledge of, of the industry and and what are the questions our clients are asking. Uh, so I think we I, I'm really proud of the fact that we haven't developed hundreds and hundreds of these data visualizations with only a few getting 95% of the traffic. Uh, what we've done is we've we've been really targeted in how we build out these user interface elements and allow our uh, customers to action on top of it. How are we doing for time? Drew, are we doing good? Okay, cool. I'll let Mudit talk through a little bit of the price optimization and um, also some of the uh, retention and prospect scoring stuff. So when we looked at uh, the last two slides, the menu maps, what's the ultimate objective? So as Vince mentioned earlier, primary teams are still going around doing their uh, seed pricing more or less on a manual basis. So we are trying to automate that process and when we look at this uh, step diagram, so these are like different pricing strategies that can be followed. So the first two, primitive and reactive, are primarily constituting towards the manual pricing approach. So we are right now sitting at adaptive pricing, wherein we look at uh, how uh, different factors or uh, attributes of a seed in a section, in an arena or a stadium. So uh, basically we try and break down each seed uh, considering it as a real estate and break down it into different factors or uh, facts that will contribute towards uh, a seed being sold or ideally what should be the price point for a particular seed. So for, for example, uh, how good is the view of uh, arena or stadium from the seed, whether it has got some weather protection or not, if, it is, uh, if it's an open stadium, whether sunlight has got to play a role in uh, when I'm viewing a particular game. So all these kind of factors we consider it in. And we are trying to implement a hedonic demand theory model for <laughs> coming up to the optimal price points for uh, any seed in a particular section in a stadium. So the, the small table that we are seeing here, it's a scenario builder uh, that we are trying and give to our clients so that they can do, uh, they can play around with, this, with the scenarios over here and instead of doing a manual pricing, uh, it's, they, they get automatic recommendations from here. So in this uh, particular table, we provide them with our set of recommendations that we uh, generate based on hedonic demand theory and uh, then we are giving them capabilities to 
play around with the optimal prices that we are recommending. And if that's basically to give them an idea if they are increasing, let, let's say if we uh, recommend price to be $20 and they feel it can go up to 25. So if they set it up to 25, whether it affects the sell through rate or whether uh, it will really uh, help them in increasing the revenue at the end or not. So all those kind of uh, assessments can be done using uh, the scenario builder that's here. So for yeah, we, I think we can move through this. Yeah, we'll move through this one. So we, I just included a bunch of other visualizations that we have in our platform uh, to talk about the actionability. Um, um, but we're using a, you know, a bunch of different visualizations uh, to really highlight the life cycles of our customers uh, and then uh, with an end goal of, of coming up with our predictive scores. Uh, but we do believe in, in giving a lens into, into how those scores, we're coming up with those scores. And to our customers, it's really important to be able to quickly isolate different segments uh, of customers and take action on them. Uh, so we're really, really focused, uh, you know, in all of our sprints, we're talking about, you know, how is the data actionable? These are the questions our users are trying to answer uh, and making sure that their questions are very, very easy to answer in action. Yeah, and you can talk about the. So in our customer life cycle module, we have prospect scoring and retention scoring. So when we say prospect, it could be one, uh, it could be a customer who has already made some purchase from you, or it could be a, a, a person who has responded to one or the other marketing campaigns that you launched, or basically you have some uh, personally identifiable information about a person. So. How do you go ahead and score these two uh, different group of people? That's a challenge because uh, scoring for people who have already made some purchase with you, it's easy because then you can go and play around with their recency, frequency, and monetary uh, parameters. But for prospects who have not made any purchase, these three parameters are missing. So we try and uh, model out all of the information, all of the personally identifiable, identifiable information uh, into different models and come up with the final scoring. And then we classify based on those scores, uh, each customer into a star rating bucket that's in one star to five star. And uh, probably five star one would be the most uh, easy or low hanging fruit. One star being the person who, would, who you would like to approach at the last if you are not having anyone else to connect to. And similarly, in uh, retention scoring, it's about if you have a, a, a person who has already made some good purchases with you, how likely he is to be in the next cycle. So can we uh, score different customers on in terms of retention? So if the person who would be a five star on a retention scale would be most likely, so probably the clients don't want to spend too much of time going behind them because they are anyways more likely to uh, uh, retain their purchases or their tickets. The ideal group to go behind in this retention module would be the uh, people in two to three star bucket because they would be like trendsetters, they might renew, they might not. So maybe aggressively campaigning towards them would yield in better results. So, uh, and I will just let check. Yeah, that's good. And uh, how do we monitor our uh, scorings? So this radar chart over here. So the blue bluish line that you are seeing, it's, uh, it's a scoring for five star customers on different parameters. And the golden line is for average, uh, average uh, scores. The KPI for this chart and for the clients would be to see that average line, the golden line and blue line overlapping as you move forward in process of uh, renewals and rescoring the customers. And uh, the bottom table is also another way of uh, tracking down how, are, how effective are we in our campaigns. So if we have, for example, in this uh, table, we had 2,663 uh, five-star leads, 2,000 out of them were emailed, and we were successfully able to convert 1,885 out of those 2,000 people. So with this also says because five star people are very likely to buy or renew, so it's easier. That's why we are seeing very high renewal rate or conversion rate 
in five star rating. Yeah. And to add to your point, Yukun, one hot encoding does helps uh, when you don't have too many features. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. And sorry about my fonts got messed up here, but we just have a, we have a couple of case studies. So we work really hard with our clients to measure um, and provide transparency and results around everything we do. Uh, and, uh, you know, Vancouver Connects, this is one of their testimonials here. Um, and so, yeah, we, we were able to grow their revenues by $1.2 million uh, over what they uh, felt they would have uh, been able to do otherwise. Uh, so uh, pretty uh, material uh, gains uh, that they've uh, signed off on. And um, yeah, we're, we're excited about working with partners like that. So I think that's it. Yeah, I wanted, thanks for giving us the opportunity to expose you guys to what we're doing. Appreciate it. Yeah.